I wanted to uh, bring this topic up. Uh, last year, you know, the internet was uh, all abuzz with uh, the updates from Panda, from Hummingbird, you know, uh, from Penguin, and then this was all followed up by uh, what they referred to as Mobile Gaddon. You know, that when Google started indexing uh, mobile websites on uh, cell phones, and uh, there's a new update that is called Rank Brain, which uh, I understand is artificial intelligence. Can you share with us, Dan, what you uh, know about this and what this means for uh, attorneys who are uh, trying to rank high for certain keywords? Sure. Well, so we, we at Lawlytics have always taken the stance that you create content that's meaningful for your audience, which for most attorneys is your uh, potential clients and your referral sources. And from what we understand so far about Rank Brain, it seems to be a, a, a very good thing for people who have uh, followed that methodology and, and maybe a little something to worry about for people that do more traditional SEO and go after uh, just keywords for the sake of, of, of keywords. Um, as I understand it, about 15% of all of Google's searches are still searches of first impression uh, for Google, and meaning that, that these are searches that have never before gone through uh, their system. And so the way that I understand RankBrain, and this is still... Uh, information that's coming in and we're still studying it and 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 frankly we haven't really been able to ascertain uh, its impact on any attorney sites whether there are customers or not uh, but Google is is saying that it is the third most important ranking signal at this point um, so the way that, that that we understand rank brain uh, so far is it's it's machine learning or artificial intelligence that really just makes it easier for uh, Google's machine to be able to take a guess at what words or phrases mean when they haven't encountered those words or phrases and really put them in context. So, so um, machines, Google, uh, computers in general, are very good at, at parsing uh, the, the meaning of terms that it recognizes, and human beings are really good at parsing uh, speech and written language uh, when, when there's the nuance of communication. And um, this purports to, to bridge the gap. And so, you know, what, what we're hoping that, that happens, and this is, this is where Google seems to have been going for a long time, is that it will just make it easier for people that are supplying uh, good information, contextual information, uh, based on questions that uh, people are actually asking Google about things that, that attorneys have on their websites, just make it easier for them to uh, get connected with the best answers to those questions. Well, one thing, Dan, that I understand is that uh, it kind of makes obsolete uh, trying to rank for obvious keywords, such as, uh, you know, plaintiff injury attorney in Tucson. Would you agree with that? I think that's been obsolete for a long time. I mean, they're, they're really, you know, our studies have been very conclusive that when you use high-level keywords like that, uh, it, it's more marketers that are going to cold call your firm trying to sell you more SEO services and your competitors that are searching uh, for those keywords rather than viable potential clients. Potential clients typically start out uh, in a... Uh, much more organic way. Think of the questions that your potential clients might ask you when they're sitting across your conference table uh, from you during a consultation. Those are the same questions phrased almost the same way that they're asking Google. And they're certainly not uh, sitting across the desk from you saying personal injury uh, lawyer or Chicago or personal injury lawyer or Tucson. They're saying, um, you know, what, what, is, what does this mean? Do I have a case? Uh, you know, do, who, who is at fault here? Uh, what can I do? When do I get my money? How much do I get? Uh, how right. much do you get? You know the, those those types of things. And and uh, so what's what's on your client's mind? Uh, even before they really realize that they have a case in some cases, uh, it are the things that they're really searching for, not personal injury, lawyer, uh, Tucson. And so I think that as Google evolves, and we've, we've been watching this happen for many years now, it's just getting much more obvious that it's going to be patently uh, apparent to 
everybody that the strategies to rank for those um, what we would term as as high level non long non long non long tail uh, keywords and phrases really is obsolete and it's just a really good way to throw money away. Yep. By the way, if you're uh, joining us uh, a little bit late, this is Larry Bodine. I'm the editor of the National Trial Lawyers, and uh, we're having a conversation today with Dan Jaffe, who is the CEO of Lawletics Marketing Software. And uh, our, our next point is uh, has uh, also to do with uh, search engines, and that is uh, there's a partnership that's been reached uh, between Yahoo and uh, Google. Now this is interesting to me because uh, according to, oh, I just checked the statistics, Google currently um, has a 69% market share for search. Uh, Bing is in second place with 12% of the market share and Yahoo is kind of trailing as a distant third at uh, 9%. And so Dan, you know, uh, what does this deal mean? And you know, are we reaching a point where every search engine is going to return the same results? I, th I think we've been evolving uh, towards that point for a while where the search engines are going to get so good at uh, parsing the intent of the person doing the searching that the good results, that the most relevant results are naturally going to rise to the top of, of, of all of the search engines. And so I, I, don't, I don't really see this particular partnership is uh, any kind of um, indicator that, that that's accelerating. I think it's just been in motion for a while. I do, I do kind of find it interesting that those uh, those stats that you uh, rattled off. I was looking at that before this this um, webinar as well, and I found a bunch of different sources that pr all purport to have the most recent market share. I, the, the numbers oh, that yeah. I got were more like 64% Google, 20% Bing, 12% Yahoo, um, and you know for, from from Google's perspective, I can see you know how this deal might make it make sense to defend market share as far as percentage of searches as as, as Bing seems to be resurgent at this point, uh, and, and Yahoo seems to be just struggling with the technology uh, as well. And uh, the the deal that they had with with uh, Microsoft and Bing uh, seems to now. Um, Allow them to play the field, so to speak, and so it, it, it'll it'll be interesting. Um, but you know, I I think that that lawyers are well served to um, to really think about their clients and potential clients and referral sources and what they want rather than what any individual search engine wants, anyways. So what I understand is that uh, you know when you see Google and Yahoo uh, connecting, that uh, it really doesn't change anything if you're already following the best practices, which would be to put up new, original, fresh content uh, online frequently. Uh, you know, this is something uh, I, I've done on my own blog, um, and uh, of course I've been blogging since uh, 2003. Uh, you know, you do that long enough and uh, the system tells me I've gotten one million visits as a result of that and I've never used any search engine optimization or, you know, pay-per-click advertising. And if you uh, do a Google search on law firm marketing, you'll find that, you know, I'm on the first page. Uh, what would you add to that in terms of uh, what are some of the best practices? Well, I, I think one of the things that that you established yourself as early on is is being a thought leader in in this area, and uh, you've been a consistent voice uh, in in this particular niche for years, and and that kind of thought leadership over time really pays dividends in terms of of not only building readership, building credibility and and following, but also building up um, authority with the search engines. And so, you know, I, I think Larry, you you've you've been a model of what to do right, uh, both in terms of, of business practices and in terms of, of how attorneys uh, can, can emulate it uh, by basically providing uh, your readers with, with valuable content, whether it's stuff that you've come up with originally or whether it's stuff that you've interpreted and put a new spin on, you know, that doesn't really matter so much as uh, the fact that you, you've, you've put yourself out there and you're constantly thinking about what, uh, what makes sense to share with people, what would people want to see and read. And I think if attorneys approach that, uh, 
approach their web presence in that way, thinking about it from their client's perspective. What do my clients and potential clients care most about? Well, themselves and their problems. And if you talk about that in a way that, that um, shows your thought leadership, uh, you really can't go wrong with this. It's, it's, it's the best possible megaphone you could ever have. Yeah, and, and the nice thing is, you know, I'm, I'm not doing anything unique. Uh, anybody can do this. Well, let's switch over now to the uh, email marketing uh, software. I thought this would be a, an important point to uh, talk about because according to McKinsey, email is 40 times more successful at acquiring new clients than either Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and I get pretty good results from Facebook and Twitter. Um, now, uh, on uh, the Lawalytics site, uh, you've been uh, running, uh, publishing a series of articles on uh, the different uh, kinds of email software. In fact, you focus on um, uh, 11 different uh, platforms. And um, uh, uh, what, what can you tell us about these different platforms? Is, is there one that you prefer? Uh, which is the one that you use at Lawalytics? Well, so we've experimented with, with using a number of these um, platforms internally here at Lawlytics. Uh, currently, we're using Drip, which we think is, 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 we've had a really good experience with it so far. We use it for our newsletter. Uh, but the way that, that this uh, series came about is um, we, we frequently get, uh, Larry, is there something, uh, is there something shuffling around? Because it's, it's nearly impossible to hear. Um, okay, yeah, now my it's apologies. I, I, I just uh, discontinued that. Go ahead, Dan. Oh, okay. All right. So, so the way that, that uh, this series arose is Lawlytics as a platform will integrate with all of these and, and pretty much any email marketing and uh, newsletter distribution piece of software out there. And our customers frequently ask us, you know, which of these would we use, can we help them integrate it? The answer is always yes, we can help integrate, but the, the answer of which would we use in their situation uh, is more problematic because needs differ. You know, Some of them want to be able to just send out uh, newsletters to their clients. Some of them want to, especially the ones that are getting a large amount of traffic, see the next logical step as setting up a way to not only capture newsletter subscribers, but say, Hey, subscribe to this five part course that does X, Y, and Z, you know, what to do when you've been injured. Uh, so you, you've, uh, you've taken Actos, now what? Uh, get our five part course, whatever the case may be, you've been arrested, uh, here's what to expect. And, um, because we don't really stand behind any uh, piece of software in particular because we do work with with all of them. We wanted to give everybody the the um, best information that we could and make that that resource available. Uh, but we've all, all of those that you see above um, Emma, I believe we've already reviewed. Actually, we may have already reviewed a few more of those now since these slides were produced. Um, and, and they all have great advantages. Uh, the, the thing that I do want to emphasize, though, is that uh, when we're talking about email marketing, unless you already have a list built, uh, and this is what we counsel our, our Lawlytics uh, clients on, is it's better to start building up thought leadership and traffic to your firm's website before you start thinking about uh, the email marketing because you need people to come and get interested in what you do. And if, if, if at that point, once you have people flowing through your website, the typical website gives a visitor two options. Option one is to contact the firm either through phone or through a form. And option two is to simply leave, go away, and maybe never come back. Well, some of this marketing automation and email marketing software allows them a third option, which is subscribe to the mailing list, uh, subscribe to get this free giveaway, whatever it is. And so, so that's, that's the nature of this. You know, uh, I personally use uh, MailChimp, and uh, I have to say it's been very uh, effective for me. Uh, using MailChimp, uh, we got all of our uh, wonderful attendees on this uh, program today. I used to use Constant Contact, but I found it uh, difficult to use, and difficult to learn and operate. So I switched to uh, MailChimp, uh, initially having a free account, and, and now I've got a, a paid account, and I'm really happy with it. 
A couple of nice things about it is that uh, it's got a nice selection of templates that you can use or a plain text uh, uh, you know, template that uh, doesn't have any illustrations because a lot of email systems uh, won't accept uh, an email or they'll put it into spam if it's got an illustration in it. Um, it uh, tells me the uh, open rates of the emails. It tells me how many uh, times uh, the, the links on the email were clicked through and which links were clicked on. And then one cool feature is you can schedule an email ahead of time. And if you're not sure when to send it, you can click a button and MailChimp will de determine the optimum time to send the email uh, based on uh, you know its analysis of your email subscribers. So. Um, I've had good luck with that, and uh, you know I would refer anybody who wants more information. Uh, the website is right below there. It's uh, for details. Go to the uh, lawlytics.com site uh, slash blog, and you can find the uh, series on email marketing. Another topic that I think Dan we should talk about is uh, Avo, Yelp, and Google My Business. Um, uh, these are, uh, well, Avo is a uh, directory, and a lot of these directories are now appearing on the first page of Google search results. And, you know, you can expect visitors to view your profile, uh, click through to the website, and most importantly, leave a review. Uh, you have a blog post on this topic on uh, Lawletics. Well, why, why is it that you can't ignore Avo, Yelp, and Google My Business? Let me give you an anecdote that just happened a couple days ago. So I, I've been I, I've been a licensed lawyer uh, since uh, 1998, but I haven't been actually engaged in practice now for several years. But I still get people that call me all the time that that know that I'm a lawyer or that that I've helped before and want referrals. And uh, a friend of mine from San Francisco wanted a referral for a traffic ticket, and I was trying to to, to think of somebody to uh, refer him to because most of the people that I know that, that might handle traffic tickets uh, in San Francisco most likely wouldn't handle something that, that's as, as small as a civil infraction. They, they're more uh, criminal defense oriented. And so I was telling him, well, I, I can go in and uh, go through my contacts and try to find somebody because he got like two or three tickets or something in a very short period of time. And uh, his response was, no, that's okay. If you don't know anybody off the top of your head, I've already identified uh, 10 lawyers in Yelp and I've already reached out to them and they're scheduled to be contacting me over the next like day or, or so. And, and that's the reality. Um, potential clients are, are looking at these sources, whether it's Yelp, whether it's the Google listings, uh, whether it's, it's Avo. And uh, you know, each of them have uh, nuances that, that I think are, are, are one different from each other and, and two very important for attorneys uh, to bear in mind. Uh, and, and I don't know, Larry, do we want to go that deep into those? Well, you know, I, I, I think, you know, we probably just want to hit the high points. Uh, it, I, I would focus on uh, reviews. Uh, most people, when they buy something, whether it's a TV set or a car, are going to go online, uh, even a restaurant, and uh, check out the reviews first. And surprisingly, uh, this is very true now uh, with people selecting attorneys. Uh, back in July 2014, I uh, published an article of some research that showed that Yelp was the most trusted, uh, the most trusted uh, review source for uh, for attorneys, and um, I got a lot of skepticism in the comments, you know, from people saying, you know, oh come on, you know, this is just a place where you look for a hot dog stand, not an attorney. But this is completely changed now. If you go on Yelp, you'll find that there, are, uh, and just search for a law firm in your area, you'll find that there are dozens of profiles up there for law firms, and many of them have reviews. So, um, uh, Dan, uh, why don't we each offer like a, a tip on what are some, some good approaches for getting reviews uh, that are positive? What, what would be one thing you would suggest? Well, for getting reviews that are positive, I mean, you know, I, I think you do good work and and uh, and those come naturally, but it doesn't necessarily, I mean, the, the, the willingness to give the reviews, that is, but it doesn't really come naturally for a client to think, okay, you know, you just got my settlement check or just, you know, walked out of the courtroom without having to go to jail or, or whatever. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is get on Yelp and, and, and Avo and, and Google and other sources and say, you know, what a great attorney this is. 
is. Uh, but in my practice, uh, and I, I did I did mostly criminal defense litigation when I was practicing. Uh, I found that that if you are willing to ask uh, the the clients for the reviews, a lot of them are more than willing to do it. And uh, the closer in proximity that you ask them for the review to the good result, uh, the more likely that is to happen. Um, and and I just just wanted to interject um, just briefly if 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 you want to get a sense of of where we think. Um, the the Google searches are going. If you go to Google and you search for San Francisco plumber, you'll see a set of results that look different than most of the Google results where it talks about qualified plumbers serving San Francisco. And it not only uh, shows their rating, which would be the, the, the rating on a one to five star basis from Google My Business, but it also gives you a chance to um, to contact those plumbers. And uh, don't be surprised at all if it goes that way with um, with lawyers and and with other service businesses in the near future. Uh, and uh, and Bing, for example, when you search for specific lawyers, uh, Bing will pull results uh, and reviews from Yelp now as well. And so it's 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 a, it's a very real thing. And attorneys that don't start doing it now, I think, or, or don't start asking for those reviews now, are going to be uh, behind the curve. Yeah, I uh, I couldn't agree more with that. You know, uh, many of the law firms I talk to have staff uh, devoted to um, uh, getting good reviews, uh, staying in touch with the clients, and catching them at that magic moment when they're uh, just delighted, perhaps when they've received their check and uh, doing their best to uh, get a positive response and to get that review online. Now, uh, another interesting topic that a lot of attorneys are looking into these days uh, is uh, mass torts practice. Typically, these are product liability cases that are brought against uh, drug companies or other defendants. They're consolidated into multi-district litigation panels uh, in the federal courts. And um, I think it's, uh, and a lot of lawyers think it's, it's the area of growth now for plaintiff injury, uh, plaintiff personal injury law. And as a result, many attorneys are uh, adding um, the fact that they handle mass torts to their website. They'll add a practice area for Zarelto or for Actos or for Risperdal. And, um, you know, it's... Um, in my opinion, uh, not the most effective approach. Uh, what I wanted to show everybody was a, a couple of examples of a, a different approach that um, uh, successful law firms are taking, and that is to create an entirely separate website, uh, an information site, for uh, consumers to go to to find out information um, about, uh, basically about their symptoms. So for instance, uh, you know, a person might be taking Actos, which I believe is a, uh, a, um, a diabetes drug, and it causes this completely unexpected result that uh, you can get uh, bladder cancer from it. And so one of the, the biggest challenges facing attorneys starting a mass tort to practice is educating consumers that there's a connection between their symptom and the, uh, and, and the drug that they're taking or that they took recently. And here's a site that does that extremely well. It's called drugwatch.com. And you can see it's got uh, you know, information about drugs and devices, FDA recalls, and all sorts of information. Uh, search engine you know, right in the middle. And the clever thing about this is that this is actually sponsored by the Peterson Law Firm in Washington, D.C. They don't brand the site as the Peterson Law Firm, uh, you know, uh, Drug Watch site. Uh, but if you dig into About Us, you'll find out that this is actually sponsored by uh, a, a law firm. And um, uh, I think this is a really effective way to uh, to get clients uh, that uh, are can be involved in a mass torts case. And, um, you know, Dan, why don't, why don't you add your perspective here? Uh, I understand that this might be something you're working on uh, at Lawlytics. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, think it's, I think it's the future of, of marketing. I think, you know, 
in a very real sense, we as a society have developed ad blindness, uh, whether that's using our uh, DVRs to fast forward through TV commercials, whether it's uh, blocking ads altogether using an ad blocking uh, piece of software in our web browsers, or whether it's just really skimming through content on the internet that we're used to digesting so rapidly and and really our, our marketing messages our advertising message detectors go off so quickly and and we uh, train ourselves to ignore these marketing messages because they're coming at us so rapidly on a daily basis that if if we didn't have that selective ad blindness so to speak uh, it would get overwhelming and and think of it from the perspective of somebody who uh, is looking for answers either they're they're grieving or they're sick um, or or both uh, and, and they may not be thinking all that clearly and they might not know whether they have a case or not uh, the last thing they want to do is have um, a bunch of marketing messages from a law firm and so if the law firm takes the the approach of educating them giving them all of the information about their cause of action helping them put things together and then leave leading them systematically down the path of uh, discovering that they have a cause of action to the point where they feel motivated or inspired to, to uh, investigate it further and then ultimately the, the next natural step is to uh, contact whoever is giving them that good information uh, and, and it just it, it not only is more effective in terms of, of, of the top of the case flow pipeline but once you get the potential client in if done right it, it can be a lot more effective in terms of, of closing the sale so to speak and then also in terms of, of client uh, control and expectation management and so one of the things that we've started doing here at Lawlytics in our content creation department uh, for, for those that don't know we, we are a software company uh, and we provide legal marketing uh, software platform that basically powers lawyers websites and uh, enables them to uh, either uh, easily create uh, their own content and put it in or to work with us and, and, and have us do it so we have a team of, of writers including uh, a number of, of lawyers who who um, act as editors and, and and guides in our writing department that create content and and we're working on several projects right now to uh, create sites just like this for attorneys and I, I think it's going to be the future uh, and, and I think that um, the more specific you can get uh, and, and and the deeper you can go into an individual uh, issue whether it's it's uh, information about a defective drug medical device uh, or something like the um, the Volkswagen uh, scandal recently things like that there there's so much information and, and you can go so much deeper than just saying you know have you have you been have you suffered bladder uh, cancer after taking actos or wh whatever the case may be uh, call us we're aggressive you know we'll fight for you we'll get you a good settlement uh, that doesn't resonate with with people as much as um, as being educated in, in a lot of cases and so um, the the other side of that is once you create this content uh, it tends to do very well in the search engines without having to pay for the advertisement so think of think of if many years ago you had done something like this for mesothelioma for example uh, the, the 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 cost per click of those are off the for, for for searches dealing with that is off the chart but if you had this information center that was was there and was uh, the definitive source on the internet for it uh, think of one how much marketing um, how many how much marketing dollars that would save uh, but also right. how good it would be for case flow yeah exactly uh, you know there's a lot of uh, lead generators out there that you know sort of charge uh, per call or per you know uh, signed engagement letter and uh, uh, it's it's an expense that you know I think you don't need to bear if you have a really good informational site like uh, brain and spinal cord org which we're, sh we're showing here you know you go to this site and uh, there's a discussion of all sorts of uh, symptoms and injuries they they talk about the best hospitals the best doctors uh, different ways that you can be rehabilitated after you've had uh, an injury like this and uh, 
you know, if you read the, the fine print there, you see that this is actually sponsored by a law firm in Orlando, Florida called Newsom Melton. And I know for a fact that this is a very effective website. Uh, they get so many uh, uh, viable cases through this site that they refer them to other attorneys all across the country. Uh, I know this because I'm friends with a lawyer in New York State who got a referral from Newsom Melton, and they said it was uh, generated from uh, uh, brainandspinalcord.org. Uh, one thing, Dan, I wonder if you can discuss. Uh, I understand that uh, Lawlytics does focus groups with lay people. Uh, what sort of information have you learned from that in terms of how to market a mass torts practice? Well, so when when we set out to look at a at developing a web presence, so if if it's something like building out a comprehensive um, web presence for an attorney that's doing, say, a particular mass tort, uh, and we're going to be creating the content versus the attorney creating the content themselves, because it goes both ways, uh, you know, we want to know the context of, of what people are thinking about. And so, uh, you know, we, we will talk with people who are not as close to that as us and, and try to get uh, information about what those individuals would be searching for. Uh, how, how do they talk about uh, the problem? How do they ask questions about it? Because those same words that they're using are the same words that they're going to go and they're going to put into uh, Bing or, or Google Google or Yahoo or or really anywhere else that they uh, might go to discover this content, and then it's also going to be the things that are going to uh, lead them from one piece of content to another within the website once they're there. So so the first step is to get them there, but the second step is to know what interests them enough uh, to be able to keep them there. And the longer you keep them there, going from page to page, the more opportunity the firm has to uh, either have them contact them right away or going back to the email marketing and, and marketing automation uh, get them into their marketing automation funnel so that they can uh, send them a newsletter or send them a piece of collateral maybe a guidebook about it you know that type of thing and so so I find that um, you know especially I still think like an attorney very much even though I've, I've been uh, also in technology and, and marketing now for several years uh, it's it's really helpful to step aside and talk to people that are non-lawyers uh, to find out how they uh, how they parse the information all right Dan let's get to uh, one of the questions that I think everybody in the program is going to be interested in the answer to and that is what is the best technique to get on the first page of Google and, <laughs> you know that's kind of the sixty four thousand dollar yeah and Here's my viewpoint on it. It's uh, it's blogging, and it's blogging frequently. And in fact, there is all sorts of research going back several years that shows that the more frequently you blog, the more leads and clients you're going to get. Uh, here's a chart from HubSpot, one of the research sources, and um, they uh, chart out you know blog post uh, frequency and uh, compare it to um, whoops, what happened there? Compare it to uh, customer acquisition, and uh, uh, in their opinion, the optimal frequency uh, for writing blogs is two to three times a week. And so, seeing that, that's that's an approach that that I recommend. Um, and so, you know, Dan, you you've actually uh, written a lot of blog posts about blogging. You know, uh, how can how can you use a blog to get on the first page of Google? What's your experience? Yeah. Yeah, well, one, I, I think the blogging is is the killer um, solution, and it has been for several years. And I think that it there's there's no sign in that slowing down, uh, despite the the the, um, the protestations of people who are trying to sell more disposable advertising. But I think it's really important to to understand uh, what is meant by the top of Google. Uh, they're, they're really, you know, when, when you really think about it, Google's not a mountain. There is no pinnacle of it. We're talking about ranking, uh, not even necessarily well for things like uh, Wisconsin personal injury lawyer, uh, which which those keywords aren't as lucrative as people would think, but for uh, ranking 
near the top or at the top of the results that are returned for search queries, questions that your potential clients ask that are actually relevant. And, and if you're at the top of the Google results for even one search done by that client that has that $10 million case, well, that's so much more valuable than being at the top for 100,000 visits that end up being nothing. Uh, yeah. and, and so when you're blogging, you can really focus in on those individual things. So if you're blogging, you know, just, just to take uh, one very specific example, say you're doing uh, auto accidents in a, a big city and you do a, a definitive blog post about a notorious intersection and that blog post has so much information that it, it lets people know that you know everything there is about to know about uh, accidents at that particular intersection uh, where where the defects are where the um, where things that, that the city should have known about where where the potential uh, issues of liability might be beyond just the, the negligence of, of one driver or another, just as, as an example, well, you really drill down on those things specifically, and uh, there's, there's little doubt that when people search for uh, accidents at that intersection, uh, which people will do that when they've had an, an accident at that intersection, especially if they think that something was wrong, you're going to be at, you know, quote unquote, the top of Google for stuff like that. And, and um, you know, I, I absolutely agree with this, this chart that you've shared here, Larry. Um, and, and I would say that, that this, the way that I read this chart, it's, you know, it's focused on, you know, how can you maximize your resources if you have limited resources for blogging. But as you go up, up the, the chart there, um, the way that I look at it is if you can go from 76% to 89% by blogging multiple times a day and your firm has the resources to do that or you're willing to invest the money to have somebody else do that well for you, uh, well then, then that, extra, um, that extra bit can be very significant, especially if those um, if, if those customers are, are valuable to you, it's from a cost benefit analysis that gap there can be the difference in in a um, in a in a good practice between a good practice and a great practice. Yep, very true. Um, and uh, you know, uh, the response I get from a lot of attorneys is, uh, "There's no way I can practice law and blog two to three times per week." And so, what I'd what I'd like to do is. Uh, second here is uh, show you an example of a law firm that is doing exactly that and that is the uh, Dolan Law Group a plaintiff personal injury firm in Clearwater Florida and you can see uh, when I went to the site yesterday they had two posts online for the very same day and they realized that the more you blog uh, the more clients uh, you get uh, so, you know, my question, Dan, is uh, what do you do if you're a busy lawyer? You know, do you just need to carve out some time uh, to do all these blog posts? Uh, and, and what happens if you can't do that? Well, so um, I, I would say there's a number of different ways that you can address that. I mean, you can't create more time, and there's a point where there's um, where it's not uh, cost-effective for the attorney to do their own blogging. But if you have an associate, if you have uh, other people in your firm, paralegals that can write well, you can leverage those. But if not, if, if you've got, so, so what happens with, with Lawlytics customers a lot of the time is they start out using our system, creating their own uh, content. And some of them get so addicted to it because they see that the positive uh, feedback cycle, they get, they, they do a blog post, they get a client. They do another blog post, they get more clients. The blog posts that they wrote before uh, cause them to have more visitors and, and, and more clients. And so it's, it, it's kind of a, a self-perpetuating thing. But then by virtue of getting those clients, because they've done the blogging or they've created the content on, on their website, they get to a point where their time is better spent practicing law, doing the intake with these clients, working off the cases, getting settlements, um, getting cases through their pipeline. And, uh, and then the dilemma comes when they realize 
look, I, I've done this and it's resulted in these clients. If I stop now and somebody that doesn't have these clients right now is doing it, they're eventually going to catch me and I'm going to lose the ground that I have. And that's that's where a service like the Lawlytics Professional Content Service can really be helpful uh, in that um, the, the blogging can still happen, the content creation can still occur even when the attorney is too busy to do it because it's just, it's just really a, a matter of the, um, the, the financial value of the lawyer's time at that point. Dan, yeah, now we've got a couple questions and by the way I want to encourage everybody on this call to uh, feel free to ask questions. We'll try to get to all of them. Um, one of the questions is uh, about uh, is hijacking news a strategy? And I would uh, answer to, to Bob, who asked the question, that absolutely, yes, it is. Um, uh, the slang for it is called newsjacking, and it's something that, that I use all the time. And what that is, is you create, uh, first of all, uh, you go on Twitter and uh, do a search for the journalists that cover your law firm or your practice area, and you uh, learn what their, their uh, Twitter handles are and you establish some sort of uh, connection, engagement online. Then set up a Google alert that is going to tell you about any kind of breaking news that, uh, that involves your practice. Uh, you know, it, it could be anything from, uh, you know, like a, a multi-district litigation uh, panel being formed by a federal court uh, in an area where uh, you handle a particular mass tort. What you want to do then is immediately go online and create just a little bit of content. So maybe you sort of summarize the news story, uh, you use the webcam in your computer to record a little video, or you know you use a telephone service and record a little podcast. Then you get that link and you send it on Twitter to all the journalists who follow you. But you need to do this early in the kind of the news cycle while they're still researching the story, and it's very effective. You know, I've, I've uh, put up material and found that, you know, I, I get called by, you know, attorneys on that day and then, you know, sort of a week after and a month after. And it, it's a great way to generate, uh, you know, free publicity by using this newsjacking technique. And a question for you, Dan, which is, um, uh, let me just see here. i got to scroll up to get at the question. I, I saw Bob had another question that, that I can yeah. address um, regarding uh, blogs on, uh, so, so the question is blog on firm site or on separate site. Is, is that the one you were thinking about, Larry? That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so um, I, I think that in most cases the evidence points to the fact that, that the law firm website and blog should be in the same place. Um, you know, the, there there are people out there that argue that the blog is like this pure pursuit that is uh, wholly separated from marketing. Uh, if you know, if you're really thinking about it that way, if you're blogging, if if you practice one area of law and you're blogging about something that just interests you, yeah, fine, separate it. But if the goal of your blogging is to drive thought leadership to your firm and to drive through that thought leadership uh, potential clients and referrals, then by all means it should be on the same site. Uh, they, they should be able to uh, digest your opinions, digest your take on the news, digest whatever it is that you're blogging about, and also be able to learn about you, your firm, and your practice areas in one place. Uh, it, it, having them separate uh, creates this attenuation that if they're going down that pipeline and they're um, perhaps getting ready to contact you and they have to go somewhere else or they, they go they, they click through to go to your website it's a different domain it looks different uh, even if slightly different it can be a little bit jarring um, it, it may break that rhythm and so so in most cases we do recommend combining them uh, and, and that's the way we have our software set up and we have it set up so you can really you can have you can use Lawlytics as a freestanding website as a freestanding blog uh, but the most effective way is to use it as both, and they, they do have built-in blogs, and, and we, we did that very consciously. Uh, a quick question here from uh, Denise. Uh, she wants to know, what are the ethical concerns of ghostwriting blogs for lawyers? Uh, uh, I'll give you my take on it, which is that, you know, of course, you don't want to be uh, convey anything that's false or misleading, which would be the rule in question. And I think... Uh, 
it's there's really no different than uh, you know assigning an associate to prepare a brief for you, which you then review and edit and make your own, and then submit to the court under your own name. So if you uh, assign somebody to write an article and you go through the same procedure and publish it, uh, I don't think there's an ethical concern. Uh, would you share that view, Dan, or disagree? I I do agree with that, Larry. Um, you know, if 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 you if you are going to only talk about it in terms of blogging, you know, I I think it's a red herring. Um, you know, it, it, you yeah. any information that you share on the web uh, is subject to the ethical rules. And if 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 you look at the ethical rules in every state that I've ever looked at them in, uh, the lawyer is ultimately responsible for the content in their marketing messages. And uh, and so you know, as a lawyer. I would not want anybody doing any kind of content creation, whether that's labeled as blogging, whether it's, it's labeled as marketing, whether it's website content, whatever you call it. As a lawyer, I'm not letting anybody uh, publish anything for me that I haven't read uh, and, and approved of and had the opportunity right. to edit. Because once it's out there, whether I wrote it or I didn't write it, if it's on my firm's website and I control it, I'm ethically responsible. Yep. So here is a list that uh, Dan and I have assembled of blog topics that your clients will read. Uh, Dan, why don't you and I just sort of pick out uh, one thing that uh, has worked for us. Um, well, uh, the top two work for me, which is read or watch the news, and that's uh, set up enough Google alerts, and that creates all the content uh, that you'll ever need. Uh, Dan, what's one, one of your favorites here on this list here of how to get uh, – Clients to read your blog posts. I think they're they're all good. I mean, they're they're all very viable. I just I think that whatever the clients are thinking about, whatever they ask you in your practice, uh, you can put whatever spin uh, you want on it. But you know, if you're look if you're looking for fodder, look at questions that they've asked in places uh, online forums. Look at play, look at questions that they ask on on Avo and on other other places where where public can go to ask lawyers questions. You know, those are the types of things that, that are, are really low hanging fruit to, to write about if, if you're if you're looking for topics. Yep. You know and uh, Bill again asked a question about what arranging for about arranging for uh, law students to regularly turn out blogs for you. And uh, I, I think that's uh, probably the best way to go. You know, you can call the local law school up and say uh, I'm paying fourteen dollars an hour, I'm gonna assigned topics and you know I'd like students to write about them this is uh, precisely well you know what I do uh, at the national uh, trial lawyers so uh, you know Dan we've uh, got a couple more slides and I want just want to make sure we get them all in and uh, maybe we'll have some time for some questions um, if uh, anybody on the call uh, needs to know anything about the topics that we've discussed simply go to the Lawlytics University at uh, university.lawlytics.com. Uh, there's a, a, a ton of great content uh, that I've uh, read and applied uh, to my own online practices. And uh, it's really wonderful, and, and you can search it as well. So here are some next steps that, uh, you know, despite what you hear about uh, algorithm changes by search engines, don't try to bother to rank for obvious keywords. You're wasting your time. Uh, pick a newsletter uh, distribution system, an email system, and send out newsletters to clients and prospects. Go on Avvo, Yelp, and Google, and check your listings. Uh, make sure that uh, your name, address, and phone number are the same, identically listed on all of them. If you want to get mass tort cases, the the uh, most successful practice that's working right now is to publish a single topic informational site. And as we've been just talking about now, you know, the more you blog, the more clients you're going to get. And uh, if you can, you know, publish three blog posts per week. And uh, with that, Dan, uh, why don't we open it up uh, for, for questions? Uh, this is everybody's uh, opportunity to get their uh, iron in the fire. Um, so, Dan, we have a question about lawlytics and uh, the costs. What would be, uh, Mark would like to know, uh, what would be the sole practitioner personal injury law entry cost for a lawlytics block? 
So the, the entry cost to start with Lawlytics is $1,000 for the setup fee. And what we do is we design you a website for that. We, uh, we help you launch it. If you have a, an existing website, we can import that uh, and upgrade it so that it works on the Lawlytics system, or we can start with a fresh one. Uh, and then it's, it's a membership fee of $200 per month, uh, which, which covers all the technology. Uh, we train you how to use it. We're there to coach you, guide you, uh, answer your questions, and, and, and basically help you uh, be very effective in writing your own content. And then we have, we have a range of content services to apply on top of that, uh, ranging anywhere from roughly $1,000 a month on up to tens of, tens of thousands of dollars a month, just depending on the scope of, of what the firm would want to do. But uh, most uh, solo practitioners uh, can thrive using the system at, at the uh, low range. You know, I have my own blog on uh, Lawlytics, and, uh, you know, I like all uh, aspects of it, uh, particularly the, the excellent customer service, because, you know, I'm on the web all the time, but I get stuck every now and then, and uh, the response and support is, is just terrific. So, Dan, I think we have time for one last question before we have to close, and I want to let everybody know that I'm going to be sending you a copy of the recording and the slides for today's program. So, last question here, Dan. Do, um, do links uh, and reviews, we've kind of covered reviews, but do links still help with ranking? You know, aren't uh, uh, inbound links uh, also important? Inbound links are important, but they're a double-edged sword. And so there's a lot of people out there that are selling links that can be very dangerous. And so when we're talking about links as a ranking signal for Google, I want to be very clear that not all links are created equal. The kind of links that really matter are the links that you earn through thought leadership. So if you write a piece of content that is engaging, it adds something to the conversation and it's worth sharing, that will happen naturally. People will, will blog about it. They'll riff off of your blog. They'll quote you. Uh, they'll link to it. They'll put you on social media because they think it's something that's worth sharing versus what a lot of these SEO people that cold call lawyers all the time are trying to sell, which are paid uh, submissions, which are, are scams to get you into link uh, pyramids and, and, and various things to try to trick Google. Uh, Google is, is is much smarter than any of those people that have time to cold call your law firm. And so, you know, when, when you're talking about uh, links and you're discussing it with somebody that's advising you to do it, just be careful of what their context is. And anytime somebody tries to sell you a link or linking service, uh, I would look at that as a big red flag. All right, Dan, I want to thank you very much for your time on today's program. Dan is the uh, CEO and founder of Lawlytics Marketing Software, an online platform for attorney blogs and websites, one that I use myself. I highly encourage you to uh, visit www.lawlytics.com or uh, call uh, Lawlytics at 1-800-713-0161. And I want to thank everybody for attending today. You'll get a copy of the slides and a copy of the recording. And uh, Dan, uh, thanks very much for being on the program today. Larry, thank you for arranging this, and thanks for having me on. I, I always enjoy our conversations. Well, the feeling's mutual. And I want to wish everybody uh, on the call today happy hunting in your law firm marketing. And we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.